Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we have a wonderful Neville Goddard lecture addressed to the imagination, delivered on November 6, 1967, titled The Bible is Addressed to the Imagination. Here, Neville starts with a quote from Blake, but goes into the ways in which the Bible is addressed to the imagination, citing from Paul and others. I found this to be a different lecture. I really enjoyed it, and we'll definitely discuss it. The Bible is addressed to the imagination. Blake asked the Reverend Trussler, who always criticized him, why is it that the Bible is more entertaining and instructive than any other book? Is it not because it is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and only immediately to the understanding or reason? If you'll take this thought of Blake, take it seriously, you'll be amazed at what you get out of it. When you think there are 66 books, it's a library. In that one book of ours, 66 books, it's a challenge, something addressed only to the imagination. The understanding is simply like the mediator. It passes through as though someone comes in to mediate some problem. And from the depths of your own soul, you are speaking to the surface of your being, the enormous, infinite imagination, speaking to human imagination, so it's not really addressed or directed to understanding or to reason. Now let us take just a simple theme tonight. I challenge you to test it. May I tell you, you will not disprove it. If you test it, you'll prove it. This is what Paul said in his second letter to the Corinthians. We walk by faith, not by sight. 5-7 Now what does he mean? You and I, when we walk by sight, we know our way by objects that the eye sees. For instance, while we are seated here, suppose the entire city was suddenly rearranged. Take a simple example. Here is Wilshire. If all the buildings on the south were suddenly transferred, still related to each other, to the north of Wilshire, and all of the north to the south, and this building here, which is now north of Wilshire, is just as far south as it is now north, and all the buildings that are now on this side equally distant. And you started home tonight, and you turned here and turned toward Wilshire, and by habit you turned, say, to the west. But as you go to the ambassador is on the north side. Well, you know right away you're going in the wrong direction. Then here is the brown derby. That's on the south side. Well, you know you're in the wrong direction. So what do you do? You turn around. Do you know you'll never get home? But fortunately for us in our simple childlike manner, these things are fairly stable. Not completely because if someone came back from the last century into New York City today who knew New York City well, they would not know New York City. They would have to be directed and ask question after question where to go and so on. I came back to New York City in 1922. Well, I have lived there for years and go back every year and every year an old landmark is gone and some towering thing is in its place. So I know the city well. I haven't really left it because going back every year for at least five or six weeks at a time, I keep in touch with it. But if you are gone, say, for a long spell of time, you wouldn't even know it. They changed the names of the streets. What was when I first came there, 6th Avenue is now called the Avenue of the Americas. You wouldn't know where you are because that was not something. It didn't exist. So now that's how I walk by sight. When I walk by sight, I know my way by objects that my eye sees. Now, how do I walk as Paul said he walked and invites us all to walk? He said, I walk by faith, not by sight. When I walk by faith, I order my life by objects that only my imagination sees. That's all. When I know where I want to go, where do I want to go? I want to go to the top of his particular business. I want to be promoted from where I am to where I want to be. Well now, how do I rearrange the structure of my mind? 
I can't rearrange the structure of the outside physically. That doesn't help me. But if I walk by faith, I will now walk by a rearrangement of the structure of my mind. All the things of my mind, and so set them up. But that's all that I see. I must now remain faithful to this state. Now he makes another observation. He said, this is the one thing I do. Well, if it is the one thing I do, I should read it over and over and over. What is the one thing that he does? This is in his letter to the Philippians, the third chapter. But the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Verse 13. Now, you name it. He had his goal, so that was his. But you need not have such a high goal. You can have any goal in this world, a business beyond the wildest dream of man. There is not a thing that did not begin in the imagination, no matter what it is, whether it's the highest political position in our world, the greatest financial structure of the world. All things begin in the human imagination because there's only God and God and man's own wonderful human imagination are one. If they differ, and they do, it's only in the degree of intensity, that's all. Heed low as we are, well then we have to either walk by sight or walk by imagination. We may falter in imagination, walking by sight is easy because we know things are fairly stable. They're not going to be rearranged suddenly overnight so that you may lose your way tomorrow morning when you come out and turn in one direction through habit to find the building isn't there and you're completely lost. But if I walk by faith, I now order my objects in my mind's eye as these are ordered here to my physical eye and then I walk in that manner. Now I can tell you unnumbered stories where men and women simply ordered it in their mind's eye and they walked faithful to what they fixed up in their mind's eye, and they became it. I think of my brother, my family, who had not a nickel, not a penny, and here he rearranged in his mind's eye a certain structure, which, if true, would imply that he owned this building and all that it contained. It took him two years, two years later, without any more money than when he started, a total stranger. I wouldn't say a total stranger, but... We knew him, but not socially. We never whined or dined with him. He never whined or dined with us. This building is up for sale. In the meanwhile, it faltered, it failed, and the sale is this day. The very day of the sale, he comes in and asks my brother if he wants to buy it. We didn't have any money, no collateral. Well, he said, I've been watching you and your father. You seem like an honest family, and so I have money. So I'll buy it, but not for myself. I'll have my lawyers bid for it, because if they knew that I am bidding, they'd bid it up. So whatever I can get for it, will you take it? What it will cost, I do not know. But will you take it? Yes, no collateral, just your signature, that's all. And that day we owned the building. We sold it. We bought it for only $50,000 in 1924, sold it eight years ago to a bank for $850,000. And there's no capital gains in Barbados didn't lose the business, didn't buy our business, only the building, only the little plot where it started, so we bought it for $50,000 on borrowed money. Did a whale of a business in it, expanded beyond the wildest dream, and then sold it for $850,000 without any capital gain tax whatsoever. That is my brother Victor. Every day, as he passed by, he saw on the marquee, instead of the name that was there, he rearranged the structure of his mind, and he saw what he would like, which if true meant he owned the building. For our name is Goddard. My father's initials were J.N. He saw J.N. Goddard and Sons, and the name read F.N. Roach and Company. Well, you can't transliterate the initials of F.N. Roach and Company and make it spell J.N. Goddard and Sons, so he walked by faith, not by sight. Sight told him it was F.N. Roach and Company, Faith tells him it's J.N. Goddard and Sons. So in the structure of his mind, he simply rearranged the entire structure every day for two years. As he walked past this building on his way to a tiny little shop on a side street which my father had, and on the way back home at night, he always stopped and looked and saw what he wanted to see. 
That was the beginning of my family's good fortune. That one had the good sense to put into practice this which is taught in Scripture. We walked not by sight, we walked by faith. Well, faith is what? Now let us go into the book of Hebrews and get the definition of faith. We are told in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So what was made was made out of things that do not appear, verses 1 through 3. That's what we are told in the very beginning of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, that what was seen was made out of things that do not appear. Well, that certainly did not appear, but it was made out of unseen things. No one by my brother Victor performing this mental act saw what he saw in this world, even in a simple manner. I can say to anyone, you see what I see, but you do not see what I see, as Blake said when someone asked him, when you look at the sun, don't you see a huge big disc like a guinea? He said, no, what I see, I see a host of angels singing, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Others look at the sun and see a disc, a round disc, a huge big guinea. And he sees a host of angels singing, Lord God of hosts. I look at a tree. Do we all see the same tree? We don't see the same tree. So I can say, you see what I see, but you do not see what I see. So you can look at someone who is in need and we see the same being, but you do not see what I am now seeing. I'm seeing one who is not in need. So we see the same thing, but we see it differently. So either I live by faith or I live by sight. If I want to live by sight, well then let me be just simply an automaton and accept everything that happens. And if I fight from now to the ends of time to change it, I will not change it. I will change it only as I begin to live by faith. So I walk in faith and not by sight. That's what we are told. Now, if there's one thing he tells us that he does, he forgets the past. No matter what he has done or did not do, he completely puts it behind him. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, what lies behind, and I then stretch forward towards what lies ahead. Philippians 3.13 Now, his ideal is to be called to the highest spot of God. That's his ideal. Maybe that is not your ideal. I hope it is, but maybe it is not. Maybe other things are pressing and you need money and you need this and you need that. All right. If that is what you need, take that as your objective. But take the same technique. Put the past behind you. Don't look back and become like Lot's wife who turned into a pillar of salt. Salt is a preservative. You want to preserve something, you simply put it in brine and you can keep it indefinitely. So that is salt. If I turn back to the state that I want to leave behind me, if I turn back and dwell upon it, I turn back to it and once more re-enter it and become it. But if I will turn my back on the past, no matter what I have done or didn't do, and then stretch forward towards what I want to do in this world and remain faithful to it. There's no power in the world that can stop me because there's no other power. You will actually become the man that you have assumed that you are, the lady that you've assumed that you are, if you remain faithful and persistent in this assumption. So this is why Blake said, Is there any book in the world comparable to the Bible? It's the most entertaining. What a challenge. And it's the most instructive. Because as you read it on the surface, it's not the easiest thing to read. But he said, If it were easy to read, it would not be worth my care. For the ancients discovered that what was not too explicit was fittest for instruction. And so if you want me to make it so explicit that everyone in kindergarten can see it, well then... It isn't worth my care. You've got to dig. They made it in this manner because it rouses the faculties to act. So you read something, take a simple, simple thing like this. One of the most glorious, of course, they're all glorious, all the books, but take Hebrews. 
In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, who reflects the very glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Hebrews 1, 1 3. Well, you read this and you wonder, what is it all about? In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. Well, the 118th Psalm, the 19th Psalm, all these psalms will give you where the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork and all these things we see as he spoke this way. But then, who are the prophets? We see as we read it, they are only instruments through which he spoke. These are the instruments. All these things came through in a not altogether conclusive way. They were foreshadowings of what God intended. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You read that, and may I tell you, from my own experience, I am still not here in this group because you do believe me and you accept it when I go across the country or if I'm invited on a panel on TV or on radio. It's the most difficult series ever to convince man to accept this son of whom I speak. They will say he means. It doesn't state it in the book. No one knows this unknown author. He remains unknown. And no one knows to whom he addresses the letter. When we speak of the letter to the Philippians, the letter to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians, we know to whom it is addressed. But the letter to the Hebrews does not in any way indicate who is the recipient of the letter. It's unsigned. No one knows the author of the book of Hebrews. But here, in many and various ways, he spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Because you read the Old Testament, and then we have a New Testament, and the churches of the world tell us that son is Jesus Christ. There, we are stuck. Now he's stuck. It's Jesus Christ. And it isn't so at all. This is the most fantastic revelation. In the end, he is going to reveal himself. And he's going to reveal himself only in one manner. Through his son. So it is the last day of the one to whom he reveals it. It's not the world is coming to an end. We come to the end of the journey individually. So the individual who experiences this son has reached the end of the road. It's his last day. In the last days he has spoken by his son. Spoken to us. When the son comes you are so thrilled and so surprised that you can't, well, can't describe it in words. And the son is David. It's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God the Father. And he calls Jesus Christ my Lord. He calls Jesus Christ my Father. So when he calls Jesus Christ my Lord, my Father, and then he appears and calls you my Lord, my Father, then, and only then do you really know who you are. I could tell you from now to the ends of time that you are Jesus Christ. You are God the Father. But not until this happens will you really believe it really believe it, really know it. I'll tell you why. You and I, I don't know. I shouldn't say that you and I, because I don't think for one moment that you do doubt the authority of Scripture, but many in high places in the world, like Bishop Pike, he questions the authority of Scripture. Yet he is the highest that in the Protestant world one can go. You can't go any higher. We don't have popes in the Protestant world, and the highest order is a bishop, so he questions the authority of Scripture. Well, that's all right. May I tell you? Let him do it. He questions the authority of Scripture, but no man can question the authority of Scripture after he has experienced Scripture. Now, Scripture is called the Word of God, and we are told his name shall be called the Word of God, speaking now of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1913. Now, in the book of John, it is said, And thy word is truth. Now, if you experience then, you know it's true, don't you? Well, may I tell you, a truth which man has experienced, he knows more thoroughly than he knows any other thing in this world, or then he can know that same truth in any other way. For I can tell you what I've experienced, and it's true. And so you've heard it, and you believe it. If you come here, I think you believe it, but you do not know 
it to the degree you will know it after you have experienced it. So a truth which one has experienced he knows more thoroughly than he knows any other thing in this world. Or can he know that same truth in any other way? So I tell you, from my own experience, as I've just told you about my brother, it can't fail you. You say two years? Well, what's two years? He was just only a kid, really. He hadn't yet turned well. He was in his early 20s when he started this. Now, he's two years my senior. And so today we have this fantastic, I would say, set up business-wise in the islands because someone really believed scripture and walked by faith rather than by sight because sight told him he didn't have a penny and no possibility of getting any. A large family, all these mouths to feed and to live, all kids, all little children. And what on earth are we going to do when we think forward in time to support a large family of 10 children, a father and mother and grandmother and aunts too, for we never neglected anyone. We included everyone who was part of the family tree. Not one went outside. If we had anything, they shared it. Then he started this wonderful walking by faith, ordering his life by objects that only the imagination could see. While others ordered their lives and walked and found their way by objects that the eye sees, your eye can only register what is right there now. If you don't like it, and that's all you're going to register, you'll continue to perpetuate it. But if you don't like it, you have a power within you to completely change it and change it radically. That power is Christ in you, who is the Father. Who is He? Your own wonderful human imagination. That's Christ in you. So tonight you can start. May I tell you, it will not take you long. You are the operant power and you can tell where you are going by simply watching at any moment in time what you are imagining. Just watch what you are imagining and you know where you are going. If I imagine certain things based upon my past and it's not lovely, that's where I'm going. I'm only perpetuating bringing it forward again. But if I would turn my back, as he said, this is the one thing that I do, forgetting what lies behind and stretching forward towards what lies ahead. If that's the one thing he does, then let me do it. But he had the highest ideal. His ideal was the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So it's entirely up to us. I invite you to try it. May I tell you, you'll never disprove it, not in eternity, but being the operant power, then you have to live by it if you're willing this night to actually live by it. I could tell you unnumbered stories where an individual having nothing, you don't have to have anything. That's the wonderful story. You start just where you are and start moving from there. But you must walk by a certain direction and you walk by the direction that you yourself set up. What would it be like if it were true? What would you want to be? What would it be like? Well, then conceive it in your mind's eye. What would the feeling be like? Now, Blake said imagination was spiritual sensation. Well, what is spiritual sensation? Analyze it. Feel a piece of glass. Can you feel it? All right. Can you feel a baseball? Does it feel like a piece of glass? No. Can you feel a tennis ball? Does it feel like a baseball or a piece of glass? Can you feel a piece of cloth? Can you feel a violin? Can you feel a piano? Do they all feel alike? No. No two really felt alike. That spiritual sensation. You can do the same thing with the ear. It's simply a living, a vivid living way of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, a vivid way of doing it. And you can do it right now. I can feel right here without going elsewhere. In New York City one night when I was giving something similar, a lady sat in the front row and she lived in the Waldorf Astoria. She said, well, I'll try it now. And she embraced mentally as she sat in the silence. She embraced a huge, huge bunch of roses. She was passionately fond of roses and she embraced roses. She could smell them. She could feel that velvety petal. She could actually, well, she could see them in her mind's eye. She saw the roses. 
She saw all these things, and then she departed, as they all did at the end of the meeting. The very next day, this is what happened. When she went back to the Waldorf Astoria, the one that is now called Queen Mother Elizabeth, not the present queen, but her mother, they gave a party for her at the Waldorf Astoria, and there must have been, I would say, 2,000 who attended. Naturally, the flowers came, like gardeners and gardens, but the next day, the Mater D, looking at all these lovely, fresh flowers, wondered what to do with them. This lady was a permanent resident of the Waldorf Astoria. He said, well, I'll tell you what, take three dozen up, calling this lady by name, take it up to her room and place it in her bedroom for me. Then take this to so-and-so and take that to so-and-so, and he distributed all the flowers. But he sent to her room three dozen roses named for the Queen Mother. It was a new rose that year named for her because of this occasion. They all knew that it was going to happen, that she was coming to what is called the English-speaking union. So when she came home that second night, walking down the corridor, she could smell this fragrance, this lovely, almost like someone had broken a bottle and the altar of roses is coming out. She stopped at three doors beyond her door and wondered if it's coming from that room. She was overpowered. And then she got to her room and saw these lovely things on her bureau. Three dozen of these lovely giant beauties left on her bureau. She simply embraced it and lost herself in feeling it. I try to get everyone to feel it and walk by faith, not by sight. Now, if something is very important to your life, maybe you can't lose yourself to that extent. And then you are looking back on what you are against, what you want to be. She didn't have to have flowers or she could completely forget anything in the world and she lost herself in embracing roses, not just flowers, but roses. And here the Mater D casually said, take these up to Mrs. Neidenmeyer, that was her name, take them up to Mrs. Neidenmeyer because she was a gracious lady, very kind to all people who lived there and all of a sudden he had one idea, take three dozen to her. So I tell you, even in the simplest thing, A lady came one day. She said, I want more money. I said, what do you do? She said, I am a seamstress, and yet I am also an artist. I design, and yet I am a seamstress, but I do aid in designing. I said, now what do you want? She said, I want X number of dollars and then minus, and I'm a single person living in a hotel, so minus my deductions for taxes and all the other things that are taken out of my salary, I want exactly $100. This goes way back in years, not today. I'm going back when $100 was really not what $100 is today. And she said, this is what I did. I held the envelope in my hand, and then I tore off the end. I could hear the tearing of the paper, the envelope. I shook the contents out, and then I counted out the money, even to the very pennies that I would get if I had X number of dollars minus that they would deduct. I counted everything out. That very week, the phone rang in the lobby of my hotel, and there was a total stranger She knew of me, but had never met me, and she asked me if I would see her. So I came down to the lobby, not knowing who she was, and here was someone who employed many people and offered me a job and paid me to the penny what I had counted out. That lady could have counted out much more, but it was more than she got before, and she was quite satisfied with it, right to the penny, and it all happened that week. Well, now, if there is evidence for a thing, What does it matter what the world will think? How could you now take from her what she has experienced? So the truth that she has now experienced is paralleled in scripture for all things are possible to him who believes. Well, how do I believe? I've got to imagine. How can I believe without imagining? Believe what? I'm believing I'm getting this money. That's what I'm doing. Well, if I'm getting it, will I not do it? Well, now bring all of your senses to bear upon the act, for imagination is spiritual sensation, and so all these things. She played every part. She could hear the paper tear. She could hear that. And then she took the contents out. She heard that. And she felt it. She felt the paper, felt the contents. Do you know that money has an odor, unlike anything in the world, so you can smell money? If I put a piece of money before your nose and you closed your eyes, what are you smelling? You know exactly what you're smelling. It's money. You can smell it. So all the senses were brought to bear upon this event. And that very week, she started working for this party as a seamstress, 
plus designing in part. And you can go through. I can take you all through even silly little things like a lady going into Stern's department store on 42nd Street in New York City. She said, now Neville said I could have anything I want if I can imagine it and believe it. Well, she had no money, but none. She couldn't really purchase anything. She takes off her hat and she tries on a hat and she likes the hat, leaves her hat there and she tries on the hat and she walks around admiring herself before all the mirrors and then she comes back. She can't afford the hat. Then she wonders, where is my hat? So the one who is selling hats asked her, what hat? She described the hat. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, I sold that hat. I couldn't find the price tag on it, but the lady loved it and the lady bought it. So he called a section manager over and described the problem. Where is her hat? He was frightfully embarrassed and he said, I'll tell you what, no publicity, take any hat in the department and it's yours. So she liked what she had on and she walked out with it. That was her hat. Another story of a similar nature. Here's a lady whose profession in this world was a lady of the evening. They're all professionals in the world. In New York City, this lady came to all my meetings and I ran into her on 73rd and Broadway. She lived in the Ansonia. She said to me, you know, Neville, the strangest thing happened. He told me that I could have anything that I wanted by simply imagining it. I said, yes, I do. I still teach that. She said, you know, I saw a beautiful hat in the window and it was, in those days, you could buy a hat for $3.50, $4, but this was $18. She said, I stood before the window, I imagined that hat on my head, and then I walked up Broadway. As I came back, I could not look into the window to become disillusioned to see the same hat there, so I walked by as though I had the hat on my head. Then when I went home, I took off the hat without looking into the mirror and put it up as though I took off that hat that I saw in the window. It was my hat now. Well, the next morning when I got up, the old hat was still there. and So I wore that hat for maybe a week or 10 days. Then a friend called me and asked me to come and see her. She wanted to see me. So I called on my friend and during the conversation, she said, pardon me a moment. She goes into her room and brings out the hat. And she said, you know, and this hat I bought, I must have been insane when I bought it. I wouldn't wear it to a dog fight. Yet strangely enough, I think it would look lovely on you and brings out not a hat, but the hat, the very hat she saw in that window. Something possessed this lady to buy it. She buys it, takes it home and keeps it for eight to 10 days and calls up the one person and says, I think it would look lovely on you. So she gets the hat. Then she said to me, but Neville, why didn't God give me the money to buy the hat? Why did he give me the hat in this manner? So knowing her profession, I thought I could talk to her openly. I said, now tell me, Anna, do you owe any rent? She said, you're too nosy. I said, I'm asking a simple question. Do you owe any rent? She said, yes, two weeks. I said, I presume you pay just about $17.50 a week rent, don't you? At the Ansonia. She said, I do exactly $17.50. And you owe two weeks, so you owe $35. What price hat do you usually buy? Oh, she said, $3.50, $4.00. Have you ever bought a $17.50 hat? That's what the hat costs. She said, never. I said, now, Ann, tell me honestly. If while you were watching the hat, you saw a $100 bill and it was all yours, you found a $100 bill owing 35 in rent and the uncertainty of your future, would you, without ever having bought a $17.50 hat, would you have bought it? She said, no. I still say you're too nosy. She had confessed she would not have bought it if she had found $100. So I said to her, well, how much must God give you to get you to buy the hat? If he gave you a hundred, you wouldn't have bought it. If he gave you what, a thousand dollars to buy it? He would do it cheaper than that. So he gave you the hat. Someone bought it who didn't like it. So what? I have bought clothes. And when I went home, I wondered what possessed me to buy it. And then called up a friend and gave it away. I've given all kinds of things away after having bought them. At the moment, I was possessed to buy it, and someone was treading in the wine press elsewhere. I was simply the one moving, and he was treading in some other place. Someone wanted a suit of clothes, so I go to my tailor. I said, I think I'll take this. So he sells me something that when I came home, my wife said, all right, so you bought it. Don't expect me to go through the door with you. And then a friend who wanted something just like it, he comes and gets in touch, and he gets the suit. So he was 
treading the wine press while I bought the suit. So may I tell you, imagination, as Blake defines it, is spiritual sensation. Really believe it. It's a vivid sight, a vivid sound. When Beethoven went deaf, all sounds to the outer ear came to an end, but it didn't come to an end with Beethoven. Didn't he hear with the inner ear? Don't you and I go and enjoy all those lovely things that he heard not with the outer ear, but with the inner ear? Well, can't you now think of someone that you love and hear what they are saying? Can't you hear them? Anyone that you know, whose voice you know, you can hear them. If you can't see them vividly, you can hear them. Well, any one of the senses is enough to get through. A touch, a sound, a sight, an odor. I know in New York City years ago, I walked through Harlem and I would get the whiff coming from someone cooking and it was all West Indian food. Why instantly I'm in Barbados. I could smell odors that only come from Barbados, the kind of vegetables that you only get in the West Indies, the kind of fruit and the mixtures. I could get everything. I walked by and suddenly an odor is coming. Why I'm walking in Harlem and yet I'm in Barbados. It just transports you 2,000 miles away. So you can bring back an odor and put yourself in any place in this world. A sight, a sound, a touch. So I walk by faith, said Paul, and not by sight. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I stretch forward to what lies ahead. Now he names the most glorious thing, but it need not be yours. You read this in the third chapter of the Philippians. So he named the most glorious thing, the highest calling in the world, the calling of God in Christ Jesus to become one with him so that before you stands his only son who in turn calls you father who calls you lord well tonight you try it for your life is forever may i tell you nothing dies but nothing dies even the little rose that blooms and you wear it in your lapel you take it out it's gone and you throw it away the rose that blooms once blooms forever nothing passes away and so tonight If one should cease to be in this little sphere, he doesn't end. He's instantly restored to life and carrying on the wonderful journey in this age until that moment in time, the last day, when he speaks to him by his son and the son calls him father. Then, and only then does he know who he really is, the author of it all. His journey in this world is over. And when he takes off the little garment, as he tells us in Philippians again, I desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is better by far. 123. Then he uses an expression which always interests me, but he said, It is more necessary, an unusual expression, it is more necessary that I remain in the flesh on your account, longing to depart and be one with Christ, because there is only one Christ, who is God the Father. But it is more necessary. When I first read that, it struck me, as the most wonderful way of expressing something that he remain in the flesh because it is essential for us that he remains and continues the instruction so tonight you take this it's very practical all that i have told you has been right down here but i will not limit you as to your goal Your goal may be God. Your goal may be anything, but whatever the goal is, take this and walk by faith and not by sight. Then take the one thing Paul said he did, the one thing that I do, and then he turns his back on anything that he's ever accomplished, and then he goes forward. Doesn't matter what he's done before. He has a goal, and now he walks by faith towards that goal. So you set it up in your mind's eye. What would I see? If it were true, how would I feel? Were it true? What would I do? Were it true? Now walk in that state and you cannot fail. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, which we will do now. There's one question and answer and we will discuss this. Now let us go into the silence.
The question is inaudible. Neville says, the fairy tales? My dear, all the fairy tales are based upon vision. Well, I will some night, but they really are based upon vision. Not, I would say, they've taken the true vision and put it into the form of the fairy tale, for sometimes that's the best way to get it over. But all the great classics are really true. And to sit down and read them and all of a sudden to see what they saw, for they're telling the truth. The Bible is simply a story based upon vision, an actual experience, but man doesn't know it and he'll fight to the death to protect his concept, which is complete misinformation of who Jesus Christ really is. I tell you, Jesus Christ is the true identity of every man. You couldn't breathe were it not that Jesus Christ became you. Actually, he is the true identity of every child born of woman, regardless of the nation, race, religious background, anything. He is the true identity of every being. That's Jesus Christ. Were he not within you, buried within you, you couldn't even breathe. One day he will awaken within you, and when he does, you are he. Good night. This concludes the Bible is addressed to the imagination. It is really nice to come back to one of Neville's lectures on the imagination. For as I have said before, Neville's very best lectures are addressed to the imagination. The wonderful thing is he's creating biblical precedent and citing Paul in particular. The idea that he walks by faith is the line that's emphasized in this particular passage. And it's wonderful to think about the idea that what you see around you with your eyes, you have to completely ignore. What we see around us often creates our reality. If you're born in a hut in some poor country, and every time you wake up, you're in utter poverty, it's going to create everything around you. So you have to change your vision. You have to change what you see and you walk by faith. The story he gives of his brother, which he's told many times of seeing the sign on the building saying Goddard and sons is such a simple idea. Many of the examples that he gives here are very powerful that you can apply in your life. The story of the roses is perfect. You get the texture of the rose petals the smell, the feeling of holding them, the feeling of having them in their room, all of those combined and you dwell in this vision that you create from your mind, then you're going to see it in your reality. So it's hard. When we look around us, it feels hopeless sometimes. It's seemingly impossible to believe that we can create something different because that's what we're living in constant recreation of what we see. So we have to learn this powerful technique. And I will continue to say, Neville makes it sound so easy. Obviously, the examples that he gives are simple examples. It is quite easy to feel a hat on your head and to know the feeling of the hat because you can feel what it looks like. You can see yourself in the window. You can walk with it. You can know the feeling in your heart. So for a material object as simple as a hat, you can do it just like the ladder technique that he teaches. You can feel your hands on the rungs of the ladder. You can wear a piece of clothing and know what that piece of clothing feels like. It just becomes a lot harder when we make more complicated portions of our reality to create. These are very basic. So if you want a baseball, you can imagine the feeling of the baseball in your hand, the threads, squeezing it. Like he says, you can hold money in your hand. It has a certain smell, a certain texture. The story of the woman that gets the money in the envelope, she feels the envelope. She sees the money coming out. She smells it. Each of these senses are gates that open up the imagination for us. Neville was very good at it. He had a vivid imagination and the ability to describe and use his imagination in a powerful way. For many of us, this is hard to do. 
People suffer from a lack of ability to visualize or imagine in a proper way. So you can come away with these lectures saying, oh, it's going to be so easy. And then you try it and it's hard. It's c- continuing to listen to these examples, you have to remind yourself that it has to be vivid. He says that it has to be vivid. And don't worry how you're going to get it. The creator is going to find a way to make it perfectly for you. So if you want that PlayStation, you're holding the controller in your hand. You see the new PlayStation the the way you like it. You see the game that you're playing that you can only play with that PlayStation. Those are the things that you have to do. It might take you two years as it did for his brother. It doesn't matter. You have to continually walk by faith. It might take you years, but as Neville says, how long is that really? Maybe it takes you a decade. You have to be faithful about it, but you have to combine all of your senses and you have to make your imagination vivid. For many, we have to train ourselves how to do this. For some, they do it very easily, but I recommend you start with something that is easy. So imagine an apple. You can smell the apple. You can taste it, which is always helpful. You can hold it in your hands. You can see the color of it. Just sit and imagine that apple. I promise you, very soon you'll be eating an apple. It might be just as simple as you going and buying one. But experiment with this. Start small. You'll get better and better at it. When you start to imagine vast timelines... It becomes much more complicated because there's movement involved. It's not simple objects, but objects in motion, in correlation with multiple things happening. So an advanced creator is doing more than just imagining an object. So much more. But you can go to places, you can have things, you can do things, you can meet people by using these vivid imagination techniques and practice. That's what I recommend. Neville obviously was good at it, but you can practice. You can practice imagining when you're in meditation. When you are vivid with it, using your sense of touch, taste, smell, sight, and you create walking with those things in your mind instead of what you see around you. If you want to live in that mansion, then go to sleep in that mansion. Imagine that you're sleeping in that bed. You can hear the mansion, the echoes of the mansion. You can walk around on its stairs. You can feel the stair rail. You can put your hands on the window. You can look out and see all these details. Don't just visualize it. It has to be dense and complete and you have to do it on a regular basis. And eventually you will. I think the easiest thing to imagine is a house. That's been in my own experience. You can walk around the house. You can smell it. You can hear it. You can even taste it. They're all different parts of this house. You can put those in your imagination. There are levels to this creation, but all of them are available to you and you are learning these levels. And the first step is just try something simple, then take it to the next level. As you continue to test yourself and experiment, you will become better and better at it. The Bible is speaking to this portion of ourselves that is the imagination and guiding us. So we have fairy tales and things that don't make sense, but it doesn't matter. There's a portion of our imagination that is the part that it's speaking to. And that is what he's addressing in this beautiful lecture. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.